And this is totally informal. Please, if, if there's something you want to say, something you want to question or query or discuss, I find it much more interesting and fun for people just to say what's on their mind and it's a bit more of a collective experience. Um, and from, from reading uh, David McCrone's book on, uh, on the very much the sociology of Edinburgh, um, I've, uh, I've got a few prompts that if there's time at the end, we, we can maybe uh, listen to, think about whether that matches up or how that matches up to our experiences of living in Edinburgh. Um, and this book is a very hard to get hold of book, which was written by an author in Edinburgh called Helen Crummett. Has anybody heard of the Craig Miller Arts Festival? Yes. <laughs> so Helen Crummy was one of the people very much involved there. And she remembers being moved out of the old town of Edinburgh and moved, decanted, into this visionary scheme uh, called Craig Moore. And in 93, she wrote this book called Let the People Sing. And for my money, uh, it's, so I've read, there, there are lots of different sociologists, I, I guess, get uh, names over time for the work they've do, d done. They're celebrated because it's, it's quite understandable. It's got explanatory power. Um, so I, I reckon this is one of the most interesting and rich historical documents of Edinburgh. And it's, she, she gives a brilliant history of the life of Craig Miller uh, from its inception, I would, I would say up to the modern day. So I'm going to be uh, contrasting a few quotes. So I'll, you can, I'll pass it around and you can have a, a bit of a, a nosy. <laughs> So I uh, apologise for the small screen, but as I've said, the slides so often just whistle past people, and I find in presentations I end up getting halfway through the slide and then turning to my attention to the speaker, and it's it's gone. I you know they've moved on. So one of those teas was really super strong. Was it maybe your one? I'd only half filled it. Is that right? We filled some. I'm just giving it a second little round of tea, and when everyone's got a cup of tea. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that everyone's going to do. Exactly. <laughs> we are a community centre, not so it's, uh, it's all a bit slapped down. Uh, it's it's really 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 <laughs> to get ever under friendly circumstances, we can do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, pomp and ceremony often drive us crazy with their process manuals. It's got to be done this way. It's got to. <laughs> it's there. Mm. So, um, to, I'm going to declare my interest. How, how have I ended up studying a lot of this? I'm being interested in histories and sociology and psychology, health and other things. Well, my interest comes particularly in terms of equity. Uh, so um, I've lived most of my life on Sink Estates around Edinburgh. And I've been really interested. I remember the first time a friend, uh, Paddy, told me about, oh yeah, these vertical villages came from this visionary architect called Le Corbusier. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, if you go to London, you can see the Barbican. This is what your house is modeled on. And I've lived in different high-rise blocks 
around Edinburgh and seen what elements of his, his vision for people living together uh, were cut and what stayed. So probably the worst uh, I found were in Oxgangs, the three high-rise buildings, and they axed absolutely every humane element from the, the, the building. It was pasted, painted in hospital and uh, sort of industrial surplus paint. There were no social areas. There was no light getting into the building. Hey, yeah. um, they, they were not good spaces to live. But if I can contrast that to Lynx View House in Leith, is a really good example of these principles of architecture that made something habitable, uh, a, a social habitat for people to live in. And lots of things have, have gone missing in our uh, the, the layout of our cities. Um, let's think, think about amenities. Uh, the steamy used to be a thing. You know, the laundrettes, shops, places to meet and share uh, conversation, so a cafe, etc. It can be the lifeblood of, for us, homo sapiens, human beings, as a social mammal. So I look, I look very hard at these things. Like uh, in, in uh, Ox Gangs, for example, there was somebody who wanted me to install a system for a local enterprise token scheme. I said, oh, well, you're, you're the perfect person to do this. I said, but you, you don't understand. There's nowhere to install this. It's an economic desert. And if it's an economic desert, there, it's very hard to socialize, to meet and do the, the, the behaviors that make us human over the span of millions of years. So, Seeing the disparities in equity, the way that people were living, um, and becoming aware of thinkers like Paulo Freire, uh, an educator uh, uh, who lived in Brazil, and he was most famous for doing uh, writing the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and. Uh, his, his interest focused on developing a liberating alternative to traditional pedagogy, which through he called uh, conscientious. I, I, I'm not going to attempt the, the Brazilian. I, I've got the Brazilian here. Yes, it, so it loosely translates to consciousness raising or conscientiousization, a process that refers to learning to perceive social political and economic contradictions and to take action against the oppression, oppressive elements of reality. So a couple of litmuses just to, to, to place that as, as I understand it. Um, so asking the question, so why is there so much extreme poverty in Britain when it's the fifth richest economy in the world? Um, the, the Tower of Hamlets in London is both the richest and the poorest borough of London. So mm, statistics can give different images. Um, and, and then think about education, traditional education. Well, boys do this and girls do that. And this has caused many a person to pull on their hair and go, no, well, why can't I do this, that the, the other people are doing. So that traditional notion of filling, of telling people how it is, is in contradiction to the, the idea of getting people to ask questions and give their experience of how it is. So if we think about education, deriving from the word educate, to draw out is it's a very different world from to uh, fill people up as if they were a blank tablet. 
So I, I, I like I like the cut of uh, Paolo Freire's jib. So I'm going to introduce also at this point a thinker uh, called um, Michel Rolf Trio, and um, no, no, I'm gonna, don't worry, I'm going to read out. Okay. <laughs> this is help to help me try and uh, meander through without going off on se eternal segues, which I'm entirely vulnerable to. Um, so, so I like this quote from. Uh, this thinker, he, he, was, he, was, he was known for historiography. So how do historians reflect on the sources, the stories that we're told about history? Um, and he, he, he talks about how whenever you create a fact, you also create a silence that sits in the shadow of that fact. And that shapes our world uh, very powerfully. He does various uh, case studies like um, the, the, the Haitian Revolution and how great uh, colonial empires could not believe that the Haitian, uh, the, the people who were enslaved to do the work there could possibly overthrow a trained military army. So, you know, Napoleon, well, send a battalion. What's happened to the battalion? No word. Well, couldn't couldn't be the people working. They they they've not got it within themselves. So effective <laughs> effective silencing does not require a conspiracy, not even a political consensus. Its roots are structural. I think this is a very powerful way to, to help me when I read s stories, accounts of history, to try and remember, okay, well, this is a statement. There is something that's not stated here. What are the silences? And I'd be really interested in what people's history of Edinburgh. What, what's, what doesn't make it into the tartan shortbread tins and uh, the, the, the guides to go to and see the, the wonderful cathedrals and architecture. Um, I, yeah, I, th I think it would uh, be a really what, a valuable thing to do, but I think Helen Crummy is an example, a really good example in her book. So working class history, so the intellectual life of the British working classes is written by Jonathan Rose. And I found this a really interesting book. But one of the things he, he opens with is, well, one of the problems of filling out this history of uh, uh, knowledge and cultural production, um, a lot of people in the working classes didn't leave behind so many work, written documents they weren't often published. Mm. But you, if you look at the, the development of libraries, as an example, some of the first European libraries were created by coal miners. And they, <laughs> I, you know, they, they would read Plutarch down the mines on their break. And so, so there, there are real strong indicators that it, money has no fixed correlation with cultural production. Uh, and again, w what are the histories that are missing? We, we know that uh, the, the cultural production of, of women has almost been written out of history for millennia. Um, and we, I think there, there, there's a, a strong thread of honesty where that's being scrutinized and being excavated and uh, a certain amount of revisionism going on. So I'm very interested in the, the intellectual lives of people uh, and particularly of people who uh, 
haven't been recognized by the formal educational establishments. And I did a, a talk some time back at BERA, a British Educational Research Association, I think it is. And uh, I, I, the talk was about the, the tragedy of the commons people, which is a, a, a flip on, on the, the phrase that's become very popular, the tragedy of the commons. Uh, the, the idea that if somebody doesn't take possession of the commons and regulates it, uh, that it will become despoiled. Um, and I, I looked at it, the history, and I thought, well, the, the people who lived on the commons, uh, insufficiency farming and whatever, actually did so much more in balance with, with the world's resources. And, uh, the, you know, um, David Graeber does a great talk on the, the, the myth of the noble, noble savage, and how uh, Iroquois Indians came to Europe and, and were regarded to be well, some of the best, most eloquent public speakers. And he argues that they may well have introduced the idea of the welfare state, because they looked around and went, why have you got all these poor and hungry people in where, where we live, we all give some food, so nobody goes, you know, starves. And that, that definitely a, a watch video on, on YouTube there. So I, I, I talk, uh, talked about um, the people who live as a part of the commons, were a part of the wealth, like big part of the wealth of our lives is other people and being in friendly relationships. And when you move people off the commons, you the, the tragedy was that people were exploited and the land. And what we've got now is uh, poor land management and poorly looked after populations in Britain on various counts, whether you look at the UN literature or not. Um, so what are the commons? The commons is the cultural and natural resources accessible to all members of, of a society, including natural materials such as air, water and a habitable earth. These resources are held in common, even when they're uh, when owned privately or publicly. And uh, so, I'm going to try and do a whistle-stop tour of starting in the 11th century. <laughs> and, and getting up to, to broadly. <laughs> and I'll caveat, I will caveat this. You're welcome to come and go as you please. <laughs> um, uh, and and all, all of this I'm, I'm writing up and uh, sourcing. Um, but I thought it would be quite nice to include this, this 17th century folk book the law locks up the man or woman who steals the, co the goose off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. The law demands that we atone when we take things we do not own, but leaves the lords and ladies fine who takes things that are yours and mine. <laughs> the poor and wretched don't escape if they conspire the law to break, this must be so, but they endure those who conspire to make the law. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, and geese will steal a common lack till they go and steal it back. <laughs> so, uh, James Boyle, Duke Law School professor, uh, 
quotes that, that poem and, and writes a very interesting book on celebrating the commons. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that it, the commons is not just a material thing. I would argue that knowledge is a, a commons. Like it, it's got an unusual property as well. Um, if I give you a pound and you give me a pound, we both walk away each having a pound. If I give you an idea, you give me an idea. We both walk away with two ideas each. So um, I, I, we're, we're born with certain inherent <coughs> capabilities. And these are more and more being uh, enclosed as to who gets to do what, whose knowledge is valued, uh, etc. I'm a big fan of Martha Nussbaum's Creating Capabilities, who deals in fine detail about opportunities. Um, Interestingly, I was listening to the program on Radio 4, which was talking about um, IA and how that is now opening back up the whole thing about copyright and um, mm -hmm. taking for artists and stuff could work. You don't even know that it's been incorporated into it. So you see them you know, stretch signatures, don't you? Really? Yeah, so, yeah, it's mm -hmm. an interesting thing, actually, because it's very yeah, yeah. difficult to source the things in. Yeah. I, 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 well, on, on that matter, uh, intellectual property, I've been reading bits of law, and there's, there's a lot of really powerful, to me, it's poetry in, in law. You know, it, it talks about the effort you've put in, the skill, the arrangement, you know, uh, and, and there's... And the pain and so you know there's 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 so much um, which and there are, there are also provisions for uh, intellectual property when it benefits society more to have an, an idea free for everybody to use courts have decided not to uphold copyright the example is Eli Whitney. He made a cotton gin that pulls seeds out of the cotton so it can be spun. And he did, it, did his patterns very rigorously. And everybody in America copied him. And he went from court to court to court. And court after court said, sorry, this improves everybody's lives. And whilst we respect you, done it all by the law, this, this idea your ideas are too important. Mm -hmm. Maybe the drugs companies can learn something from that. Maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I, well, I think that this is part of why I'm studying this, to understand the origins, how, how the social configuration come about to this day, is, uh, has become increasingly important to me over time, because I, yeah, it's just, I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's lots of reasons. Um, so the, the, the enclosure movement was the idea that you could, that, that certain people, not others, fenced off the common land and went, we're, we're using this land for agricultural improvement. I know you used to take a partridge or plow a furrow here, different, the, we've got a different vision now and we're calling it agricultural improvement by and large. Um, and drawing sufficiency from the land, most, most commons are based around ancient ancestral rights in British common law which predate the statute law passed by the Parliament of England. An individual who has a right to draw their subsistence from the common land jointly with others was understood as a commoner and as a part of the commons people. People retained, tradi uh, retained traditional rights, such as allowing their livestock to graze, collecting coppicing wood, 
uh, and cutting turf for fuel. These were all part of uh, collected life in in Britain. Right. I. I This this is a this is a, a journey for me. From the, a friend a friend who spoke five different languages but was a native Gaelic speaker said, "You know what you are, Alex. You're de racine." I said, "What?" <laughs> and he said, "Well, that's French for uprooted. You don't know your history. You don't know where you've come from. You're, you don't know." Mm, yes. And since that time, for example finding out that they banned Gaelic and Scots was it a by act of parliament. Uh, they banned Highland dress. You know, and, and no trivial punishments. Uh, and realizing more and more of these histories that weren't, that I never encountered in formal education. <coughs> they, they make a big difference. They're not looking at the seaweed that comes, uh, you know, you can harvest it and collect off the shore. It's amazing fertilizer when you mount it down. So how much have people been demarcated out of ways that since time immemorial, people knew if I need a roof over my head or some firewood or some food, I could do that. Our family could do it. Friendly strangers could do that. Well, so what motivated the enclosures? I don't know the history. Um, you know, there must be a reason why it happened. You know, why why there was the com there was more common land at least before, and then there wasn't. So what what happened? I, oh, well, sorry. I I, I, I suppose that. that's 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 a big question, and, and I'm starting early with right. ancestral rights. But hopefully I'm going to lead, I mean, these, these are all vignettes, I right. guess. And uh, the, the motivations are married and varied over a thousand years, you know. Um, and um, I, I guess my, my inquiry is not uh, finished. Yeah, nor if, nor if, can I give a simple answer, response. I just, um, I just wonder. The yeah. official explanation is right. agricultural improvements, use of wine and green uh -huh. land. Yeah. But then it's a bit chicken and egg. <laughs> <laughs> um, so an example of ancient law is the ancient rights of keyhole tenure. And this is fascinating. Uh, Sir Lawrence, uh, Sir George Lawrence Gom wrote about traditional rights, such as the ancient belief associated with homemaking on land in his book, The Village Community. And this is a quote. The old tenure, locally known as keyhole tenure in Hampshire, by which if a squatter could build a house or hut in one night and get his fire lit before the morning, he could not be disturbed. You know, this is... And what's the importance of a fire? You know, and the fire has so many, I mean, deep connections with us. Uh, it, it brings people together and it obviously brings houses together. And so I'm going to talk here. Uh, about the myths of feudalism and manorialism. Uh, so feudalism has come to be a very loose term to allude to suggested arrangements of legal and military relationships among nobles and serfs between the 9th and the 15th centuries. Uh, to a significant extent, it is a construction of later centuries to account for a past order of things from which manorialism extended, uh, a suggested scheme of legitimacy presiding over the legal and economic relations between nobles and peasants. So, yeah, we own the land, you work the land. It, it's, it's I been, it's I been that way. Uh, and 
we, we find cultures doing this fairly regularly. So, for example, the Greek culture and the Ionic culture reinvented itself, uh, reinvented itself by giving the, the history of Alexander the Great a makeover. <laughs> um, so what, everything we know about Alexander the Great was uh, a PR exercise. Hello, Lee. <laughs> I said, good. <laughs> please feel free if you're, you're hungry and you want uh, to grab a bit to eat get, just do so Don't, we're not on ceremony at all please um, so I tuned into um, Susan Reynolds work in her book Fives and Vassals the medieval evidence reinterpreted, uh, published by Clarendon. And Susan Reynolds brings a new interpretation of what we have received as the order of things in medieval Europe. Her work unsettles romanticized notions of noble and serf and debunks a myth of pyramidal feudal society in early medieval times. Um, According to Reynolds, the ideas come to be associated with feudalism would not have been recognized by many in the medieval period. Before 1066, the structure of relations between peoples and property rights was not so hierarchical as it has become painted. There were, wasn't these extreme vertical relationships we've got now. And, and as I paint this, uh, pattern of land ownership uh, and other forms of ownership to present day. We, we can see what's gone from a reasonably horizontal society to an ex a super extreme vertical society, uh, which is now sort of like a skyscraper wobbling. So are you, are you saying that the, the extremes in our society now, you know, like in income inequality, didn't, have never existed in that ratio in the past? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And vividly so, by several orders of magnitude. It, so, um, sorry, it depends how you, you know, what's your metric. Well, there, there's an interest in economist who, who talks about the metric. Now, would you rather live today or 200 years ago? Because today I can listen to music from uh, the Beatles or Haydn. I can uh, print things, you know, it's, you're, you're right. How, how do you interpret this? And uh, Susan Reynolds' book looks at this, and certainly a, a scheme that I've been developing is uh, to define uh, working classness as um, the opportunity to choose. And the more finance, in effect, you have the more opportunity you have to choose. Mm -hmm. Come and work in my biscuit factory, Alex. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, that sounds great. I, I think I'd like working in a biscuit factory, but it's a choice. It's very different from, I, I, I absolutely need to get any money just to buy, buy some food. Um, what are you going to say, biscuits? <laughs> <laughs> Another great reason, <laughs> if anybody owns a biscuit factory. Anyway. <laughs> mm. um, so 
the good ways to thank them like this. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that on 200 years ago, that you'd be living with the feudal landlord, <coughs> so you could see him as well, and he would see your poverty. Whereas now, the billion years, we don't know who they are. The people that own the world, we're never going to come into contact with them. They're never going to come into contact with us. So we don't. We, so. The, yeah, we, the closest we get is a glimpse of the Times, the, is it the Times Wealth list or something like that? I don't make a point of reading it. I think, but, I think um, the question raised a moment ago mm -hmm. about metric yes. is super important mm -hmm. because we probably cannot talk about poverty or being rich just like that. Mm -hmm. As if, as if the two are sort of permanently, universally, in perpetuity, unchanged. It depends on the metric. <coughs> what was great just now, you know, how do we define poverty? Yes. You know, what we are talking about poverty now and a few hundred years ago, I'm not exactly sure we are talking about the same thing. That's that's an important. I, I think I veer towards the work of Professor Philip Alston, who visited Britain a few years back, uh, I think it was 2018, 19, and he was a special rapporteur on the human right, uh, on extreme poverty. And another, another measure, uh, another thinker, who's another special rapporteur for the United Nations, Pro Professor Jean Ziegler, who looks at the, uh, the human right to food. So if, if we... They didn't touch the curtain. Yeah. 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 We could. So, yes, well, we could do many lectures. So I've... I've uh, thinking about one very simplistic measure of uh, poverty or well-being, economic well-being of a country, uh, gross domestic product has commonly been used. Uh, and it's come into more and more criticism in modern times as, as it, it's problematic. Um, uh, I think we, it would be good to take a, another day to read out and look at the, the differences between absolute poverty and relative poverty, the impacts, how they manifest in uh, social well-being. Uh, for, for example, how do we interpret the work of Sir Michael Marmot, uh, his longitudinal work looking at where people are placed in a socio-economic hierarchy determine, determines the length of their life and the, the health in their life. So the lower your place on the, the scale uh, of socio-economic uh, uh, indices, the sh you know, uh, you're, should we count having 10 years less of our, on our life or 20, 56 in some places? I, 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 yeah. yeah, it's true. We've moved by a culture where money wasn't needed to survive to a culture where if you don't have money, then it's very difficult to survive. Food, clothing. Home. You end up my grandparents, for example, lived in a tied house. Grandfather worked on the farm, and tied house had a, a garden where you could eat bees. You just had it, and the garden was big enough to use food for the family. 
Yes. So if we're thinking about percent, the, you know, what percent of the, the land is owned by what percent of the population, then not like Scotland, not, well, it's changing a wee bit now, but you know, if you think about Scotland recently and, and how much was owned by just a few people compared to then, what Oh, so, you know, so it's, it, it, it's contracted to so uh, Andy Whiteman yeah. uh, wrote uh, yeah. the poor Muir had no lawyers, and he points it puts down the the ownership of the land in Scotland is now what uh, point zero one six. Uh, you know they, they, these are tiny fractions. If we go back to nineteen twenties. We've got um, Perito, Alfredo Perito in Italy, who looked at the land ownership uh, per uh, per capita in Italy and found that the Perito relationship <laughs> uh, came to describe um, about eighty percent of the land ownership was owned by about twenty percent of the people, uh, and. I think that's what I'm, I'm trying to track here. In, in, it's, it's not that I'm, I'm telling a concrete story because that what's important to me is to, it's almost like finding bits of a puzzle, cutting them out and putting them on a big jigsaw and rearranging it. I've, I've not got you know, some uh, uncanny insight into knowing what's right or wrong. I'm trying to put together uh, uh, a picture of the world to understand uh, more about the world I'm living in. And I've been this, really impressed in a shocking way uh, how people have been uprooted from not just land, but really basic things like freedom of movement, being able to practice in various professions, being able to um, uh, well, being indentured until the age of twenty-one or twenty-four. You know, they, they, these these things I will will get to. Um, uh, I I may be pre I'm presenting one set of things, and part of what why I like doing these uh, events is to get other people's critique, uh, input, um, and the histories that we all hold collectively in this room, um, unfiltered, I think, would be a, a spectacular volume. But they're all m mysterious to us individually, um, and it's hard to get at them collectively. I think the point you have to look at isn't land ownership as being a modern concept, it's land tenure. Because there's different systems of holding it in common at different times and different cultures. In the Highlands, the clan chief didn't actually own the land. And if you were to go up to the Duke of Buchanan or Gaia and say, well, give us that land back, actually, I don't think it would actually get on very well. But um, because it was a verbal society where there was an understanding that was uncodified in the 18th century law. It's, I mean, the, you talked about the tragedy of the Commons. I can't remember the name of either of the Commons. Garrett Harden? Right, but it was countered by um, Eleanor Ostrom. That's right, yeah. As saying the, the tragedy of the Commons was kind of a myth in the sense of um, it wasn't that it was just, you know, classically you would, there was nothing to stop you overgrazing your goat, so it basically turned into a desert. She pointed out there were system, informal systems, even if there weren't laws or 
proxy ownership that prevented that happening, even if it was like, we'll kill you if you do that, you know. But, but there were, like you say, there were verbal kind of but the very morris which was the whole way of administrating land, where there was an yeah. informal meeting. Right. And even in Gaelic society, they would allocate different fields to different families. And right. There was a discussion within the community, and now that I was, if I'm coming relatively recently, yeah. that would get together and discuss what they were all going to do as a community that day. Yeah. Which might be a model which was maybe more ethnically organic, right. exactly. which was supplanted. Yeah. When written law and tenure became codified. Yeah, it does become more complicated when you end up with atomized, you know, individual rights. You know, but also a lot of freedom comes along with that. Mm. The most important person in the community was a minister because he was the only person that could read, <laughs> and he was sort of duty bound to. He he got his his income from the the way. Mm -hmm. And it was his job to sort of collect essentially taxes from all the yeah yeah we get them to agree to things yeah I mean so all all this points to uh, a very important caveat in relation to doing history how do we do history how do we judge you know some phenomenon actions of 200 years ago because we are judging from where we are now <coughs> um, is that a fair way of doing history um, that that's something that we have to ask ourselves well, i think you have, you have a very important point um I, and there's, there's a really interesting group uh, by james c scott called seeing like a state and it's just a brilliant book about looking at the, the big schemes of state and changing things. Uh, so, um, and, and how they spectacularly failed at times, but the, looking at the complex and mixed motives. Uh, I think we do need to understand this at the sense of relative and absolute. So, for example, a landowner turning up to a village on their land and saying, get out now, where if you're not out when the building's burning, that's unfortunate, isn't it? And the factors in Scotland, for example. I, I, so I would argue that that's, that's sort of absolute, we can make a... Uh, a, a judgment on well, because <laughs> that's that's wrong now. I think it would be wrong in a million years and previous. It's a it's a brutality that undermines the what I would argue is the engine of what keeps us together, uh, the friendliness, the companionship of society. Uh, that that's my ideological perspective. <laughs> I, I believe we come together because together we collectively manage to reach uh, a gestalt. Uh, the sum is great, uh, the total is greater than the sum of all its parts. Uh, and I think that. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know, it's. And uh, I, I, when a, uh, a collective of people is. Um, not on basic or on friendly terms. I'm, I, I would I would migrate away from that society. Anyway, that, that I I think yeah these 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 points of r relative poverty. Well, what do we happily give up for? When you say you migrate away from that society, where would you go? Well, that's that's the the it's a it's a problem with with all diaspora in the sense that people may be trying to get away from uh, a tyrannical government or the the land's no longer habitable 
and we're we're seeing this with climate breakdown. Um, and what, what's interesting is also the the history of our. our, our we come from diasporic groups, <laughs> following seasons. You know the. The, the, the mushrooms in the north of Scotland uh, and the berries and the, the fruits, you can follow it down as the temperature changes or, or you know, but the migratory routes, we, life significantly changed when we went, oh, okay, well, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to plant out crops. So the, the, the farmer in relation to human history is is big news and there are many different perspectives on that um i'm trying to build up a, a complex collection of uh, moments so that i can ask questions about well you know what what can i understand of poverty in britain here today what is a poverty um i guess i i'm not at great answers in terms of relative terms but i've certainly found absolute uh absolute poverty that we can talk about so i hope that, that gives you a sense that i'm trying to be nuanced, nuanced. <laughs> and with your help uh, i will uh you'll improve my thinking can i ask you alex whether whether you have an overall thesis to work towards. I mean, do you know where your destination is? Do, do you know what I'm Yeah, I, I don't, don't think so. Um, all the bits and pieces, or the different scenarios or stories, episodes that you're looking at, are you thinking in terms of all of them pointing to a particular conclusion? I don't think so. Um, I, but but there there are lots of big questions I've encountered that sort of sit in, you know, the kimchi of my brain, uh, brewing over time. Going well, so questions like, well, what makes a society a good one? I mean, presumably, at some point conclusion will emerge in your mind. Right? I, 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 I spoke it's about... the journey, not the destination. I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I... I spoke about a scheme of what, what, what does working class mean? And what, what does that mean in, in really tangible terms? Uh, and from my study of it, like, so if we look at the root of the word leisure, uh, it, it's to do with uh, permission, giving permission. So if I, I can make a distinction, if we make a, a, a category of people, um, you can take a photograph of, of Blackpool Beach, and we can go, there's a category of people in the water, category on the beach, there's a category on the road. It's just a way of grouping. And I, if we look at uh, an example of law is how when we've got, when we get our travel documents, passport, we have to find somebody and go, could you vouch for me? Uh, and that goes back to a statue introduced uh, in the 13th century. Um, prove, how do you prove who you are? Now you can't, you have to get somebody of better social standing. And only then you, you're validated. And the, the law today on the travel passports, you, you find it, somebody who has something to lose. <laughs> now what happens with people who have no, nothing to lose? And think about Marmot's socioeconomic indices. Uh, it makes sense to me that at the very bottom of the socio-economic industry, you've got to ask for many more permissions than people who are at the top. So 
e Elon Musk, for example, I don't think there are many times he goes, may I do this? Um, whereas at the very bottom, it seems life is always led by, do I have the resources to do this? And I need to ask permission. Who do I need to ask permission to do? And that's exhausting. And exhaustion is chronic stress. And chronic stress leads to all manners of diseases. Um, it, it's, a working, it's, a, it's a working hypothesis I've got from the, 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 this strange accent I've got. Uh, in Mr. McCrone's book, he talks about the way you say your vowels. The, the word to use. People go make a reading. And go, oh, they're from this cultural group. Think about Pygmalion. Uh, uh, and I'll get you Henry Higgins. <laughs> yeah, my fair lady is a player. Um, which school did you go to? Don't tell me. It's very Edinburgh. <laughs> it's, it's very Edinburgh. That's a very Edinburgh one. Which school did you go to? Everywhere you go, everywhere you go. Which school did you go to? Or what school did your father? <laughs> <laughs> As only if you're, you're a native to the plant, if you're, if you're a first, second generation, you know, the fact that you went to school and then was enough to, um, you want to have that kind of sense of belonging to. When I was growing up, there were 12 levels of school in Edinburgh. There was nowhere else in Britain that came close to this. So you had all the kind of private ones and then the the better kind of corporation schools that were called that they had a fee and then there was about two more that a slight kind of fee and then you got the fee ones all together there was like 12 levels going from Becky's coming right down to and if you went to James Gillespie's or if you went to Castle Green then you know yeah. mm -hmm. Edinburgh was totally unique and nowhere else was coming to the same number of layers of uh, <laughs> in Macron's book, he talks about Edinburgh being a city of castes, and this this has been this prompted <coughs> looking at uh, uh, you know an, another thing that's prompted me to try and get out of the Eurocentric perspective and understand well is is what what's the relationship of caste to class and uh, how many times, for example, if I wear this, are there any people in Edinburgh who will choose not to talk to me at all, i.e. not even give me the, the time on their wrist? You could be a hedge fund member. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. If it says Tesco or Sainsbury on it, then they know the position you more. Uh, you know, wear, wearing a shirt and tie, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that, that gives a different signal. The shoes I wear, the accent, the, there, there are all of these <coughs> swatches that, that seem to be uh, used in terms of, will I, will I speak to this person? How human is this person? Because there's a level, of, it's about dehumanization, I feel. I think uh, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a minimum, absolute level of respect which every person you know, should be afforded. Mm. I, I, I do believe that. I can't give you absolute <laughs> definitions. I am a great fan of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a project. Mm. Uh, 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 and we can go back to Darius the Great who had a similar project, you know, what, what, what is equitable? And when people know what's equitable, I eat true for me as it is everybody else. And if I put a big list of these things in the marketplace in four different languages, so everybody can read them, and everybody go, oh, well, if I do it I, this way, I've done it by the rules. So if something goes awry, I can turn around and go, wait a minute, I've just been duped out of 
a field or or a, a chair that I've made. The code of Hammurabi is an example of that. The the you know. Yeah, so, so equity is a good thing to promote coalescence. Um, and what we see in the, the enclosures is a different, uh, is different visions. And at the end, like, I'll, I'll really go through the enclosures, the early history, the, the so from the, uh, the, 10th century to the 13th century, briefly. Briefly then, the Elizabethan era, era from the uh, 16th century to the 18th century, uh, and then looking at the lowland clearances, which were an extension of this enclosure of land, uh, looking at things like cotters and traditional family tenures, uh, the, the relationships of, uh, of how people came to work and live in the land and how the people were moved on. And in the Highland Clearances, which was really abrupt, very violent in, in certain parts, um, how the different accounts of what went on. And, oh, well, there was this marvellous project of improvement and then we've got eyesight, you know, eyewitnesses going, well, they basically came into the village and said, get out in six days. We we're burning the whole place. If, you know, what about our sick? Well, if they're still in the, in the buildings, that will be too bad. Uh, we've got the is it Lord Chancellor of Edinburgh uh, saying, we, this, this is an extermination of the cotters. You know, lots of skills, lots of heritage and culture. Uh, uprooting people from the land, moving them into urban centers to work in mills, you know, the industrial vision of enlightenment. And um, so, so that, that idea of conscientization, you know, what, what, are the con what are the different versions, the different written accounts of this? And uh, I've got an example on Craig Miller. Uh, suggested, uh, you know, very beautifully as a, a Gadesian project. <laughs> you know, Patrick Geddes. Uh, some, some called him the father of town planning. <laughs> now, when you go through Craig Miller, uh, having read a little of Patrick Geddes, the, the, the town planning, uh, nobody was in agreement that the, the, the community that was created there was sufficiently uh, healthy for a population. Um, but certain accounts of it, you know, it sounds great. So if it's the vision of Patrick Geddes, fine. the tracks and they diverted all the trains around the suburban lines at the urban break was. And she was just telling me about this. There's a stone at the window, not actually up next to the seat we were at, but just the one in front. And it broke the outside of the double doors. And uh, so she was just saying that this time, you know, how wonderful Craig Miller was meant to be in this stone at the train. <laughs> But I think after about three, four years, they got moved again to Portobello or something like that. So it's similar. Mm -hmm. They knocked down the slums in Glasgow and moved everyone to some four new towns of Livingston, Cumbernauld, and Glen mm -hmm. And there was no community in places. People didn't gel. 
Was it part of the Newtown kind of movement, basically, sort of across the UK, where the Craig Miller was built? Was it the Newtown, basically? Yes, it was. Uh, they expanded the, the, the borough of Edinburgh to create a new electoral ward around the dual three villages, dual New Craig Hall and Craig Miller, which were part of an estate of the Warham. War uh, the Newtown was slightly different. That was up in right. Genova still, to be yeah. house people in Glasgow, right. but the solution to this was the problems was to demolish all the Victorian buildings mm -hmm. and then right. create new world to house them in these newly created towns that would be the utopian existence. Right, but a lot of the girls can house them in. Yeah, the anyway, so. yes, actually, a lot of Glasgow was saved by local residents who, because there was a huge big storm that damaged a lot of the roofs and all the property that was actually zoned for demolition. And it was actually cheaper and quicker to repair the roofs. And it was a movement by the people that actually pushed back against the wholesale destruction of most of Glasgow mm -hmm. and started renovating the tenements. Absolutely no thanks at all. To the brave new world planners of the 1960s. So this was this was taking place before or after the new town or alongside that. The new town development was that really came out of Operation Overstuff and the population of Glasgow was too big. Right. So the plan was to build new towns, to get new industry, and that these shipyards and Scott Lisbon things could employ like five thousand people. The mines are all failing and the steel making is all failing. So the idea was to create new towns with like industry and right. attractive government incentives. Mm -hmm. I've, I've read something recently, so I'm, I'm a little bit angry, so, uh, more generally about new towns that um, it's kind of related to, partly to the creation of new belts around. So basically, uh, uh, as the cities expanded um the, there was basically nubism on the edges of the city so people were losing more and more so of were complaining about the expansion of the cities and then you ended up with the creation of the green belt which blocked that so the idea was you could avoid um this opposition from, from local people and their political representatives by basically going out to the countryside and creating whole new towns where there was very low population so there wouldn't be opposition. But it didn't really work because there was still opposition but just from the landed people I guess. Um, and so it was kind of abandoned halfway through, maybe just as well, I don't know, but um, that was my I, I'm quite oh, you interested um, your, sorry, the yeah. rest of your sorry, talk, yeah. actually, because no, yeah, no, no. you kind of got stuck in this movie. Well, yeah. well, if there's... The rest is really interesting, but I'm kind of, I really want to hear a bit more of what you're going to say. I, I, you know, the, the conversation is so good and it's so important and and it's in that dialogue space. It's in, when everybody starts sharing, we, we get multiple pictures, multiple comparisons, and and if, if there's a first for work, I mean, I, I could do, uh, I, I guess, any number of, because I've read so many accounts now, uh, I, I could uh, do, do talks on all sorts of things. For example, I'm doing a complete essay on um, Malthus, Thomas Malthus, as a, an economist, has been quoted to justify all manner of things, like moving people out of uh, certain areas, uh, choosing not to feed people. Uh, but by going through all the parliamentary records, you get a very interesting a view on how this thinker has been used to justify large-scale decisions. But I, I, I'll go through some more of this history. So, enclosure as a long-running process. Um, 
Uh, over the centuries, we've seen a, a trend in the concentration of ownership of land and its associated means of sufficiency into smaller and smaller numbers of people. The most eluded period in the history of, Brit uh, history of Britain that illustrates this trend is that of the enclosure movement, which took place between 1750 and 1850. James Yelling argues enclosure can be more broadly seen as a pattern of legal process in England, emerging from the 13th century onwards, consolidating, brackets and closing, small, small land holdings into larger farms. Spanish development in Scotland? Uh, what's the Spanish development? Portugal. For, for, for my one, uh, a civilization is created by people from all over the world. And uh, the Spanish I've met. Spanish pirates stealing gold. They were bringing the gold up from South America. You go and steal it and bring it back to Portobello. That's why we've got the name uh, Portobello over in um, uh, Central America. Right I, 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 was, I thought That's Portobello was Portobello. Italian. Portobello. I, I know that it's got an Italian connection. Beautiful port, Portobello. Um, I am aware of Robert... Uh, who, who did the... Um, it's not Pirates of the Caribbean, Treasure Island, Robert Louis Stevenson. He wrote that whilst looking out over the Firth of the Fourth. And yes, you're right, there's a large history of pirates. Mm -hmm. uh, the Baptist Church, that was Fred Archer, they built his house. And it was a great place to park his boat. And um, the sand, all these houses are built on sand. The sand was right up to them. But what about um, O'Donnell, um, Red Hand at Monster, you know the Irish flag? Um, the Irish flag, Red Hand, each O'Donnell chops his hand off to be the first, uh, uh, it was the first white hand to touch Irish soil would be king. And it was O'Donnell that did it. And the, uh, so it's Irish and Scotland were all together. England's not related at all. Could we go back to that culture and history? Um, yes. What do you oh, think? Please. Who were the people here when the Spanish are when the uh, Spanish are I will do a special talk for you. Uh, <laughs> and... I think we need a series of talks. <laughs> do you know those the the card work? It's just the old times read West of Portugal, just West of Portugal. They still have the pipes and the kilts in North Spain. That's where we came. The beauty of history is it seems that there's always more to to learn. Uh, so um, with that thought, uh, we'll, we'll talk later. Maybe I'll try and maybe you could do the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so here I, I've put a a, a really for for I think these are two important statutes that that pave the way for the next eight hundred years, um, and in twelve ninety, so property rights started to crystallise when lodgers and the subdivision of houses were declared not to be legitimate by dint of the monarch's overarching allodial title, so. In 1290, two, two statues were passed. <coughs> you've got to forgive me. I've not studied Latin, so my pronunciation may be guff. <laughs> this is mainly the effect of passing of the statutes Quia Empt Torres and Quo Warento by the Parliament of England in 1290 during the reign of Edward I. Chia Emptores prevented tenants from alienating their lands. So suddenly, right, basically every land now from, from now on is all subsumed under the monarch. Now the monarch gives, 
a tenancy of sorts, right? You, you have this parcel, you have this parcel. Now, you may, you, you cut a tenancy and that will come, that always comes back to the monarch. So you can't sell off a patch of that land to somebody else. Ultimately, uh, there are subletting arrangements, but you're subletting in a sublet system as a really primitive account of this statute. Is that the <coughs> Sorry? Is that the I don't know about the one to switch to but it's just land all into little strips and it's like feudalism and you all got a strip of land to work on but you had to fight for king <coughs> ah, right. that's how that I remember sounds... I mean, sorry, that's a nine year old's memory of it that, that sounds it's just for young Scots yeah so so you, you, you get this parcel of land but there are certain duties that yeah. come with it military and uh, fiduciary so money uh, involved um Quo warranto derives from the Latin meaning by what warrant. It is a prerogative writ requ requiring the person to whom it is directed to demonstrate what authority they have for exercising a right, power, or franchise they're laying claim to. So, going back to having the passport, right? so who the heck are you? Who is going to vouch for you? goes back to this by what warrant, uh, I, or at least I can see similarities. Um, so, wait a minute, I lived on this land, I've lived on it for generations, and some, some sods just put a, a fence up around it. Who are you? Who, who are you to go into the legal system? Because we need to name, name you. Uh, so is this when surnames start coming out of that I, I suspect there may have, I, the, was the Doomsday Book not quite um, involved? In, uh, the, I know that as literacy, written, uh, lit, rit, literacies became more and more numerous and different print technologies emerged, um, it afforded lots more administration. So, I dare say it is, it is something I'm looking into. I'm quite interested in the, the history of marriage as a legal institution too. <coughs> um, pardon me. Because it, for uh, the, the, the laws of couverture um, denoted women as property. Um, and that lasted right up in the 70s, where women were, you know, of this uh, last century, I've got to remember it's the last century, <laughs> uh, whereby women, to get a bank account, open a, even a bank account, they oh, well, you, you need to get your husband's permission. Well, what if you've not got a husband? Well, which other man? So it's looking to permissions, a permission structure, Again, so, and this is a very significant, so I spoke about keyhole tenure, right, okay, I put a, a roof over my head, I light a fire, I've got a place to stay tonight. The, this was repealed by the Erection of Cottages Act 1558, so we're now in the Elizabethan era. era. Um, built on the foundations of the Erection of Cottages Act, 1588, uh, inclu uh, the enclosure of commons land from ancestral tradition of homemaking uh, without appeal um, uh, took place. And from that point, people had to appeal to the manorial lord, can I do this? And Exemption from this act could be obtained by petition at four times a year based on grounds of poverty. This permission was sought from the person who held the title of lordship of a given manor. The enclosure of people and land went further uh, because 
statutory law had been building up in different countries across Europe uh, that I know of, uh, but there's, there are lots of histories of law that long predate uh, this. Um, so, a critical moment was the Labour Law of 1563 put into place by William Cecil, Lord Burley, in the Statute of Artificers, which Adam Smith referred to as the statute, statute of Apprenticeship. Um, and this is a quote from Heckscher's book on mercantilism, uh, which is quite a well unknown book on, on uh, I guess, economics pre Adam Smith. Merchants very much had theories on how trade was a part of, of a country uh, and how it worked, etc. So that, that's where mercantilism sort of encapsulates. Um, so the quote is, it was one of the most remarkable results of e English economic policy. In spite of the much greater activity of the French monarchs in their heyday, neither in France nor in any other country is it possible to find any other attempt at so thorough a control of the whole industry of a country during the mercantilist period. Its origins and formation are particularly able to throw light on the characteristic features of English development. So a part of this statute of apprentice, uh, apprentices or artificers in its, its uh, um, original title. The, these, so um, a Professor Attire at Oxford wrote The Rise and Fall of the Freedom of Contract, really interesting book. And he point, picks out several points of how the law was, was introduced. Now, they make the point of going elsewhere, they had started doing certain introductions of, of regulation, of law, land improvement, um, but never was a project so done in such totality as what it was enacted across Britain. Uh, the Statute of Artificers Act imposed the following, Control of entry into the class of work, skilled workmen via compulsory seven-year apprenticeship. Reservation of superior trades for the sons of the better off. Assumption of universal obligation to work and all who are able-bodied. Empowerment of justices to require unemployed artificers to work in husbandry. Requirement of permission for a workman to transfer, transfer from one employer to another. Severe restriction of the freedom of movement of the poor. Enablement of justices to remove people to their original parish or place of settlement. Enablement of justices to fix wage rates for nearly all classes of workmen. So these are it's very significant. If you move a parish, you know, uh, people will find you and bring you back and go, no, no, you didn't understand. You're meant to plant the, the fields. Uh, I know you used to go and forage for berries, you know, in this time of year, no longer. Um, And this, this is a little bit of an aside, but it, it also gives a long picture of, of what's happening to the, the evolution and maturation of the statutory body. Um, so that the statute of artificers remained active on the statute book until 1819, the same year as Petersfield protest took place in Manchester, where 60,000 people gathered in peaceful protest to call for representation and parliamentary reform. At that time, Manchester didn't have any representation in the, the political system. 
despite having a huge population. Uh, you, you had lots of what they called rotten boroughs down the, the south, southwest of, of Britain held a lot of them. So people who just had a position in Parliament and could cast votes, but didn't really have any, um, uh, what, what do you call it, population that had voted, oh, you're, you're a good representative. Yeah, you'll, you'll represent our interest. Um, so in, in response to this peaceful protest, I think parallel to this is the Napoleonic Wars. Um, uh, in response to this peaceful protest, 18 people were killed and an estimated 400 to 700 people were injured, resulting in the travesty being named the Peterloo Massacre. So what happens when people say, well, we need representation, people, uh, it, it won't work without some basic level of equity. Um, so the control of the movement of people, I'm going to zoom in on for a moment here. Um, and uh, David Mayle wrote about a, a book called uh, Gypsy Identities from 1500 to 2000 from uh, Epi, Epiquins and Moon Men to the ethnic, ethnic Romani. So think about diasporic people, people who had not been born or lived in a village and didn't have those familial uh, and kinship ties where, oh, oh, well, that's Davy down the road. He's, he's great at sharpening knives or, you know, bringing in the barley. Um, people who were moving through Britain had to get permissions, extreme permissions. The identity of traveling people remain fairly mysterious, as David Mayo writes. They have perhaps been excluded from the histories of immigration, as it was forgotten or not even realized that gypsies did not arrive in England until the early 16th century. It raises questions about whether significant subpopulations prior to the restriction of movement by British statute moved around the country with the seasons and whether gypsy became a word which was proxy for those who attempted to circumvent the law. So you can see suddenly you don't want these diaspora and then people roll into town, well, they're the gypsies, you know, not playing by the rules that we live by. And the denigration of uh, migrant communities has, um, has not, I guess it's not been an uncommon thing. Uh, an interesting moment um, in Manchester history. The, the Flemish weavers had arrived in, in Britain and they've got all these amazing textile skills. And they think, surely, surely we'll get a, a few takers. But town to town, they were told, sorry, you, you, you make great textiles, but you're not a part of the guild. Something unique in the Charter of Manchester is that everybody is allowed to get work. And so the Flemish settled there. And you've got these transfer of, of brilliant textile skills uh, moving into uh, affect textile industries in, in industrial Manchester and, and very much benefit. Um, I believe they've been Jedinburgh as well. Mm -hmm. Flemish leaders and that whole bit Picardy place, that's where the Picardy place it came mm -hmm. from the part of I I had no idea that the you know down in Leaf you know, see a lot of Dutch architecture uh, mm -hmm. and the the significant uh, international connections that you've got um, and and if you, uh, do, does anybody know google ngram mm -hmm. 
So uh, it's a Google tool where you can put a word or a phrase into it and it will tell you um, how often this word has appeared in books that they digitized from, and it goes back very long way, but what was noticeable to me was that gypsy only occurred as a word for in the 16th century, same time as the enclosures. So it, it, it's what that, another piece of the puzzle I put on the, the jigsaw board and I go, what will I find out tomorrow? Uh, I might find that find out that there's an account that takes my my thoughts that way, maybe one that way. But these are all uh, moments in progress. So now that the poor laws, you've got the enclosure of people, you've got you're in the fields, you're in the offices, uh, crudely put, but you've got a visible increase in poverty. Um, and they had to introduce poor laws. Now the poor laws were uh, an act of the relief of the poor passed in 1601. Uh, and it gave church wardens and overseers the authority to build cottages on waste and common for the use of the poor and inmates with permission of the manorial lord. Uh, in, the, in this act, we can also see how the labour of children could be legally bounded, bound to indentureship by church wardens and overseers. So this servitude could be taken from the male child until the age of 24 and from the female child until the age of 21 or the time when she was married. That's a hell of a lot free labor, you know, a statutory labor. And it's, yeah, so like, well, how, how are we differentiating, say, an, a, a sense of what, what we think slavery is, could have been back then, or compare that to the, the, the slaves in Marcus Aurelius's household. Uh, what freedoms and what opportunities did they have? Could they go, I'm, uh, you know, I've got my day off. I'm going to pop out, have a coffee, read the newspaper. It's not, it's it's not really clear to me. I mean, you, yeah, you, you're giving a, a kind of list of yeah abominations in modern terms um, against ordinary people, which, but then that's you know that's until probably the 1840s when you know there was an accumulation of work and power that eventually would lead to you know, universal franchise, then, yeah, no, that's the that's the history of this country, no doubt, and, and probably the world is, is uh, it was a, a world of domination and protection rackets, but, but, it, but it doesn't really explain why, you know, up to the point, like where you say, there's protest, and there's, you know, there will be rebellion, and we kill the lords and screw them. So, but that has to be a reason why you go from one type of society to another, right? Even within a period, like just listing a bunch of, you know, what to modern people is atrocity, then that doesn't explain the, mm. how the change in history, you know, how things have changed or why. And that's why I don't, I'm not quite getting other than a list of, like, yeah, things that we, Think probably quite bad these days, you know. But that's well, yeah. Well, you know that. <laughs> well, so if you, well, the, uh, well, yeah, so uh, I, I think I'm this. I'm sharing some findings that are part of my road to trying yeah. to understand psychology of. I, I th um, one of my working hypotheses is the new high score, like when, when you. When you've got so much money, let's say, that you could spend all day every day shoveling it into a furnace and, and still have mountains, 
why 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 do you go out what 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 of the human creature makes one go out to get more and and in some cases Most want people some people have not to have any <laughs> and there are multiple <laughs> And, and each each talk, I guess, is like packing a suitcase. You know, do we talk about poverty, or power, or history, or sociology, or psychology? How, how do do we talk about moral disengagement? What what say I've got my pension fund invested in agri agricultural uh, stocks? Now, what, what makes one person say, I, I can't invest in that because these are deliberately creating famine? Uh, it, you know, if we look at uh, Professor Jim Zeigler's work on <coughs> the United Nations, he, he documents this in, as his time in the United Nations. Oh, just, all I'm so, asking is, like, why, why things happen rather than just kind of... Yeah, I mean, it's important to know the, the facts of, of what happened. I'm just asking why. As of, as of yet, uh, I, I mean, it's not. I'm it's, sharing. I'm sure it's contested, and the, the answer is contested. Why? I'm sure it's complex, but, you know, we should have some kind of vague idea of why the enclosures happen. Oh, agricultural improvement is, is cited in nature. You know, yeah, but there was also, I mean, I'm just grabbing things back here, yeah, yeah, but there was presumably industrialization, so there was a demand for, for you know, workers to work in like, the mills, or whatever, but there was, you know, it wasn't just like a bunch of rich people sitting there going, oh, how can we screw the workers even more, you know, because they would have done it already. If, well, if, that that's be. that's why I mentioned James C. Scott's seeing like a state. I think it would uh, I would could only be, give a poor answer in the space and time we've got here now. The 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 work seeing like a state. I know, is, I, know the basic right. I, I I think he does a, a really good job of going well. When you ask these questions, they're always context specific. Uh, the, the the categorical why or what or you know is 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 a categorical. It does. It there there may be patterns that that thinkers look for across time and place, but there are lots of different. Uh, Answers to that, all of which can be answered. And if if I'm standing in front of a room, I'm going well. I'm I'm on this. Like I'm still at you know a, a really nowhere near an end. I've got to learn a lot more uh, about the bits that tell me more about why. Um, I, for example, if we look. At the production of uh, gunpowder. This happens, uh, is it? Uh, they, significant stocks of it start to uh, be used uh, around the 11th century here. I, I, I'll i have to check my, my dates on that. Yeah, but so I think my for, take you off your for example, so how can power uh, be extended. For the first time, you've got weapons that, that are uh, allow very few, a small number of people to impose their will on a large number of people. Uh, Jared Diamond writes uh, in his popular book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, of uh, metallurgy and uh, weaponry and, and health. So I've not even picked up on the plagues of it, you know, and the, the drastic reduction in population, and that resulted in smaller numbers of people turning to the, the merchants and saying, you know, 
I think we deserve a good pay rise. <laughs> and, and this causes uh, a change in the cultural configurations, which cause uh, uh, responses in the people who, who, who have been born with this bit of land and always looked after this bit of land and the people on them. And, uh, they were, people are encultured by the context they are, they grew up. So, yes, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't give a, a it, I, it's almost like the, the general theory, the specific re theory of relativity. We, we, going to a context like Edinburgh, for example. Yeah. You know, that, and that's where I think you can get further into that question of why. Uh, and and uh, James C. Scott shows all different motivations from the, the, the very noble, but misinformed. Uh, the Stalipin reforms, for example, in, in Russia, and just went right, okay, well, we'll take all the land and we'll give everybody a patch. That'll be great. <laughs> But on the drawing board, it's very different from how it planned out. Not all land is equal. Not, not all land has rich alluvial soils. Some, some is suited for wild meadows, some, et cetera, et cetera. I think he's, is helping people get out of polar perspectives. Because I, I, I have a, an idea in my head of, the, the great human collective as all of the above. <laughs> now, what, what, what truth is true? Well, all of the above, when you can find, tie it to a context and give yourself the evidence that you're not just like, oh, well, <laughs> I've decided that, it, you know, somebody, Bob from Farfield, wrote this history, but I've never met Bob. There is no, I've just invented, you know, anyway. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, my brain is going in so many different yeah. directions I've been inspired. I want to get the book, but I didn't know how much time to allocate. I was just going to yeah. say, same thing. What, what, so how's it going to pan out? I know. I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to other talks, and I can imagine a series in autumn of so many of the different <coughs> If, if, if you want, I, I, I'm very happy to do it. Um, where it's going is um, <laughs> um, the, the, the land ownership, the ownership of land has changed radically in, uh, over the long span of history. And the people who own the land have more opportunities uh, to determine what happens in the world than not. And that's, that's, the, that's the overall pattern that I'm seeing. And, and responding to th thoughts on absolute and relative poverty, I've been thinking about what, what are the social determinants of health? Because we, you know, we, we've been gummed up with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is, is a neat little pyramid that gets wheeled out. But um, uh, yeah, the, there are a lot of things that that humans need that are uh, like like freedom, relative freedom of movement. Um, uh, like um, uh, company, like you know, so, so I'm I'm looking at that to to respond to what if somebody lives a well, on the surface it's good they've got a dishwasher all mod cons, but there, there's this rising uh, discussion about deaths of despair. 
why, why, why are people taking their lives when on the surface, the economic read of their life is, wow, what a blessed life. Uh, if we, we know that if you put somebody in an empty room, it's recognized as cruel and unusual, un, an unusual punishment. And this informs how, how we treat people who have been put into the criminal justice system. A lack of the things that uh, we need to express ourselves as human animals can be as damaging as any physical assault on us. Um, so, well, so I've got. Oh, sorry, do you want to go back? <laughs> I've got a question to do with the clearances, right? Yes. And it's um, it's 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 an idea that I've taken from something else, and I'm I don't know if it applies to Scotland, but I'm interested to see if it does, right? And what all of you think about it, which is to do with it's to do with <coughs> the um, intergenerational trauma and how that affects health, right? Because of the epigenetics of it. And whether people's displacement from the land is was a traumatic experience, right? Which which then goes through the generations, and people might not be consciously aware of it anymore. But it, it affects people's immune system. It affects you know how how their their bodies deal with stress, um, all of that stuff. And whether so, I don't know enough about where people were displaced to, but mm -hmm. I was wondering particularly with like Glasgow, why it has such poor health outcomes and whether, so I, I, I've tried to look online and I've not seen any literature on it, but, but people have written about, for example, um, slavery and I've looked more into that and how, uh, you know, you can see, um, or even like the work that they've done with um, women who when they were pregnant had suffered a lot of stress and how that affects not just their children, but then the, the, their granddaughters because of the eggs that are obviously being, you know, in the fetus. Um, so you can see these patterns that way. And anyway, this, this is, it intrigues me. And I, I don't know if any of kind of... I've had this theory that. as well with ISIS, with different spiders. Um, yeah. yeah. As far as I understand, and um, I don't know anything, but nobody else does in the room. So no, you're fine. Right, you're fine right here. Uh, no um, judgment here. But, uh, I've read uh, Robert Plowman's book recently, Blueprint, and it's about genetics and DNA revolution. And yeah, I don't think there's much in that. Epigene I mean, epigenetics doesn't really mean anything. It just means all the other stuff. Well, beyond, it, it, it's to do with how genes are expressed. Like, so, so that there is, that there's already been quite a lot of research yeah, which I shows think, I mean, different what, outcomes for, for people who yeah, have gone through traumatic neither, neither of us know, know anything, so it's a bit pointless. But, but oh, I, have, no, no, I, have <laughs> read, I have read very recently <laughs> that it doesn't stack up what you're saying, and I know it's, it's very, it's appealing to me, I'm, I'm a kind of left liberal kind of guy, so it's appealing that idea to me, but it's not to say that that's the only factor, but scientifically, it, from what I've read, it, it's not well, really there's a, there's a program just on radio, we are talking about epigenetics very recently, just like, yeah, it's it's sure, epigenetics switch. works, but the idea that, that it's kind of some trauma from slavery or whatever, is like passed down in you know through genes uh, from well, it's not what I've read, which is that's sweet genes. That's anyway, I, I, I just think it's more. It's, 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 I mean, yeah, maybe somebody that does know. I was just thinking, you, you started your question by relating it to clearances. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how the clearances in Glasgow is related because I haven't heard anything from the problem, maybe because I'm, I'm just late. So. Yeah. So maybe some kind of context, and especially relating to Glasgow, because you don't know. Because so, you've not got to the clearances yet. No. And, no. Uh, what, what time are we? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five right, okay. This is part one. Right. Right. Oh, okay. So I'm going to have to go. Part no, two. Two. Okay. Yes. Start, start. no, 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 no worries. Uh, it's, uh, I, I hope. I, uh, I hope it's been. Uh, 
Please replace Kimberly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it represents the world. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Yes, please. Uh, if, if, if there's anybody who wants to stay, tell me whether I should whistle stop five or ten minutes or fifteen minutes, or or shall we? Well, it sounds like it would be useful to, to do something while you do. Yes. No, I didn't have to run off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I cut because I feel I need to wash these up. Very right. quickly, what we've got is the enclosures moving from south to north, and they happened in the lowlands of Scotland first. Now, the, the, the mechanism by which you saw this happening was the emerging of farms. The first super farms started to emerge, and it ha happened over a longer period. Rather than forced evictions, you have uh, just the, the lack of renewal of tenure. You have certain uprisings where people started uh, driving all the sheep out of certain areas in the lowlands. But more and more people were driven into the urban centres to find work in, in the mills and towns. The highland clearances were much more radical, much more abrasive, much quicker. And uh, they, they were done by factors who uh, got, got the job done by hook or by crew. So not all of them did. Some of them were really brutal, just torched villages. Now you've got diaspora being going abroad. And in fact, I've got a little poem. See you, Jan. Um, a, a poem written by immigrant communities in Canada about the lament for the factor more. Uh, the big factor on the Chamberlain of the Duke of Argyle's lands and mull and Tyree. <coughs> when they heard in Canada that that beast had expired, bonfires were lit and banners attached to branches. The people were cock a hoop with joy as they met one another and they all got down on their knees and praised God that you had died. So they weren't happy about their experience. But there's also another history of the people who'd been dispossessed and moved on, going to other places and dispossessing other people. Mm. And that, that is, uh, I mean, I, yeah, you know, what, what's done in the name of uh, financial profitability we're, we're, we're now once again coming into a technological development which will make us all wonder what our relationships in economic terms are. Well, picking up on your epigenetics, you know, you know, there's a lot, a lot of really good research on this at Cambridge <coughs> Uni and uh, looking at methylation patterns and acetylation of histones. Uh, it's, it's emerging as a science, mm. but something that is very measurable and not controversial science. Uh, you know about glucocorticoids and cortisol. Mm. So cortisol is a stress, uh, stress hormone. This is terribly bad for our bodies. And chronic uh, stress is as bad for our bodies as acute stress without being able to speculate on the genetics, you, we could, you, you can definitely measure cortisol levels and directly link them to um, uh, health conditions. Um, Glasgow, I did ask a guy called Gordon Asher in Glasgow, I was walking around trying to think about why Glasgow, and he, he said, well, I reckon one possibility is you've got a lot of industrial ground. This factory made 
tar, this molasses, this smelt of lead, this. Now, when they scrap all the industrial seats and then built on brownfield sites, what you've got is contaminated land. I'm, I'm talking to seed uh, 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 um, and uh, academics who work in the environmental uh, area of sciences. And uh, Rachel Locke is doing some really cool work in different schools and finding that if you analyze the soil on uh, less, in less affluent areas, you find things like high concentrations of lead. Um, the, yeah, I, I worry and fear uh, carries down through generations. I spoke to a gent in uh, Ottawa, uh, just strangers passing in a cafe, and uh, he's. He said that he was there to try and find descendants of Ashkenazi Jewish origin, uh, saying that a lot of people had moved there, hidden their cultural history from their children, mm -hmm. so didn't know about. So I, I can only imagine that when you're standing in a culture and in constant fear of a wreck, um, and it will, it will, and does show in, in uh, certainly um, DNA methylation. Mm. But uh, yeah, <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, obviously, yeah. It, there's lots of that that will all be interacting, you know, in complex ways. But when does this program end? Obviously. Ooh, it, it, it's on if you, if you look at BBC Sounds. Oh, so it's like, um, yeah, it's still, it's still available, but I can't remember. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really sorry, I have to go. With that. No, no worries. Yes. Yes, well, I'm, I'm going to start uh, wrapping up. We'll get the time. Thank you so much. It's really Thank you all so much. Uh, well, so much. we. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, uh, um, if, if anybody wants uh, to email me, I can send you the slides. Yeah, uh, lots, lots of written resources that I, I've, I've got <laughs> together. <laughs> and <laughs> the, what, what I'm trying to do is um, do these comparisons and, and get the histories that, that I don't find written so much. We get policy documents, we get uh, grand ideas of enlightenment and, and like big, big, well-versed ideas. But uh, in the day-to-day -day accounts of things, like living on ox gangs as a, as a council estate. All uh, right, right, okay. What, what, he, what, what of sufficiency is in this area? And town planning, is, you know, it, it makes a lot of people snore. <laughs> but I've, I've become so interested in it. Like, um, Ray, Ray Oldenburg looks at the great good place. And he analyzes American cities. And he said, well, when you've got this suburban sprawl with nowhere to meet your, your neighbors or, or past time of day and chew cut, it's very bad for people. Is it? These are societies designed for automobiles. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like how with the new builds going on everywhere in East London. There's no infrastructure. Yeah, I, and to you know, in in one book we get an account of Craig Miller as uh, a, a vision of Patrick Guinness who's a really interesting thinker, uh, who thinks in multifactorial ways and uh, complex ways. 
And we've got an account of people, uh, you know, a family that had been moved out of the, the, the town into this, um, the, this project that was roundly slammed in a, and we, we've got to get, I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get the perspectives of people living in situ and go, uh, what's your experience? You mentioned 12 levels of school. What school does, you know, there's, there are these things that are active. Um, so how, how would you like me to finish this? Just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to say there's all these housing estates built, but you don't have to be a rocket scientist to calculate how many schools and medical centres you want to be Yeah, for. yeah. It's only until you're the one doctor is overloaded. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. They're not the building shops and, and it's community centre and that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Alex. Oh, yes. I was very interested in what the poem about the bees. Yes. The first line actually appeared in my book. <laughs> <laughs> because the woman, uh, I, I'm showing you King Tomorrow, uh, which is about an artist uh, and, and peace activist, and she was one of the women coming women, and she was actually involved in a what, quite important case when she was a human woman. I mean, she's now in Scotland, I think she, she moved back to Scotland. She was involved in this case when um, she and another person was charged for trespass. But they, they actually, after a lot of through different courts, eventually they appealed to the House of Lords, which they, they decided that actually the MOD bylaw was invalid because it's a common, common act. Nice. So, so mm -hmm. it, she talks about it in the film and also her other actions in Green Common and also uh, when she's back in Scotland. She bought a, a woodland and used the near coupot and used it for eggs for action. So it's Sweet. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether you would be interested. I'd like to leave you with a thought. <laughs> the gentleman there had said, uh, Oh, you just, you know, this is a list of all the, 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 the things that have gone wrong and. Blah, 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 blah. Now, yes, I've been gathering together the pieces of history that don't commonly get spoken about. It, 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 you know, another talk about uh, the, the fair poetry of Robert Burns. I, I think uh, there are lots of accounts of history that get foregrounded because of their positive. I think uh, there are a number of histories that make us feel slightly uncomfortable, but I think that this slight discomfort of going into new places and, and holding things so that we can make up our own minds is it, uh, probably the, he the space that's healthy for but I think it's healthy for me to try and get them there. There was a documentary that Billy Connolly did uh, quite recently, and he got moved from the slums from Glasgow into a tower block in one of the new towns. And he said it was fantastic, an inside toilet, the first time he said that, an inside toilet. But, no I guess, shops. yeah, there, there are no shops, no community centre or something. They never <coughs> knew the people who lived around them. <coughs> Um, he just said that he felt totally isolated. Mm -hmm. He was only there for a fairly short time, but um, you know, presumably his parents would have been there for God knows how long. Um, but I, I remember I was actually uh, I was living down north at the time, and the uh, girlfriend I was with was quite keen to come back, not to Edinburgh, somewhere a bit nearer. So uh, we had to look at Bourbon. Uh, I don't know if you those or school ones. They had cleared the land completely. There were no trees. 
there was nothing left. I mean, if you looked at a leaflet for it, it showed a, a picture of a castle, a part of a ruined castle. When you actually got there, this part of the ruined castle, I think it was joined onto the side of the floor or something. But the old town of Urban was very kind of small, but apart from that, everything was just completely clear. And one of the most noticeable things was the lack of trees, you know, lack of mature trees, because without that, the place just looks totally empty, totally dead. Uh, that, that, that is uh, a really important point that Helen Crummy picks up on, but also Jane M. Jacobs. She was a pioneer sort of social commentator critique, uh, critical of uh, planning in the, mm -hmm. the States and points out, no, 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 we definitely need the green environment. We need social play areas, we need libraries, we need... Yeah. But the thing about trees, mature trees, gives it a kind of permanence, you know, it gives a kind of depth to the place. And if you take them away, it doesn't matter how many kind of modern facilities you've got. A place that's completely kind of dead, you know. You've then basically got a field of concrete buildings mm. in it. Um, trees are such a. I don't, I don't think you're particularly aware of it until you see it missing. Mm. See it missing, and probably now there's quite a lot of trees, you know, because I'm talking about 40, 50 years ago. Um, but uh, at the time, I just had no kind of feeling to it. It's, just, it's hard to explain it. You're tuning in something that's very well studied. Without those green spaces, our body releases stress hormones, mm -hmm. and those stress hormones put us into a catabolic state and cause all sorts of illnesses. Mm -hmm. Now, there's plenty of grass and stuff. Plenty, plenty of, kind of parks and things like that. Mm -hmm. There is something about trees. Mm -hmm. I was living in, uh, I actually lived in Tower Hamlets for a while. Uh, yeah, we were moving about, and the place that I felt more comfortable in was, was one where there was a big tree outside my window. Mm -hmm. In other places, it was all just concrete. And it just made me feel, feel so depressed just to mm -hmm. look out the window, and all you see is this grey. Mm -hmm. you know, but but look at, look, having that tree just, just uplifted your spirit. Mm -hmm. Professor Hughes is a big case in point because it was built as a visionary centre getting away from the work successes of the new towns and that lots of green space for no trees and then lots of parking for folk can't afford cars and it was built in a very 1970s vision. I did some work there when I was young and foolish and thinking you could make a difference and I started <laughs> proposing urban forestry. And it oh, wasn't okay. until I persuaded the council and did some figures on how the sheer cost of mowing grass and how much cheaper it is to have ground cover and trees, and you wouldn't believe the resistance it got. Mm -hmm. You see them everywhere now. If you see a roundabout now, the go to solution is ground cover. They were previously mowed. And you see, there are some like that. Well, yes, all sorts of things, and oh, the, the resistance. It, Planting trees and roundabouts, animals would run out and cause accidents, and folk wouldn't pay attention because they're looking at the trees and which <laughs> <laughs> they cause resistance. Yeah. 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 Every day I see an artist's impression when you build in the big book, I sort of look at it and I'm a laugh because it's always a sunny day. Always <laughs> sunny. <laughs> 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 you know, but artist development, you use computer perspective, but very often it's utterly impossible to see that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, they also have a token tree. Trees are white like people, they like living together. Yeah. They don't like being yeah. 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 a token. They communicate. There's a fantastic book with Hooter Wolf Hansen, something like that, he's a German arborologist. Yeah. And it's about the secret life of trees, yeah. it's utterly yeah. wonderful. Yeah. 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 Thank you for extremely food. Thank you. It's Nadine, yes? Yeah. Hey, yeah, how are you doing? Until <laughs> <laughs> so next time. Until next time. Uh, so.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank uh, you now, please, if there's any of this you like the look of, give it a good one. Yes, I'm not going to take one. I'm not going to take one. I'm not going to take the, the, the slides are so, so many. Well, I think if they're there, you do tend to read them. I mean, and, and the last one, the, the Italian girl is doing, you know, I was reading it all because uh, sometimes it's, you, you, you miss some things that she's saying, you know, but it's you know, on the screen. So I think if it's on the screen, you'll read it. But, uh, if it's not. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it worked. Well enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 